So <clears throat> today we'll be starting and finishing off chapter five and starting on chapter six. We're not going to go. Um, we're not going to be able to finish chapter six completely. So this is going to be more or less partial chapter six. Um, I will try to find a good stopping point and stop. However, integration is an important concept, so I would like to cover it. So um, I will cover whatever, however I much uh, I can, however much I can by Tuesday and uh, try to find a good stopping point there. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Last time we saw vector valued functions and what to say, uh, how they're differentiable and stuff. And some of the results still hold true for vector valued functions or com and complex valued functions. For example, theorem 5.2, theorem 5.2 still holds, still holds for um, vector valued functions, vector valued functions. Okay. However, um, <clears throat> so does theorem 5.3a, okay, um, and b. However, uh, when you take uh, 5.3b, you have to be careful. Uh, the product fg with fg replaced by <coughs> f bar dot g bar, right? So there's no <coughs> product for vector valued functions is not taken the same way. And so instead of product, you take um, dot product. Other results might or might not hold. Um, <coughs> more important, most importantly, mean value theorem, mean value theorem does not hold. Um, does not <coughs> always hold. Always hold. For example, if you look at the complex function f of x, f of x is equal to cosine x plus i times sine x, then uh, this is slightly hard to prove, and we are not going to prove this right now, but this is equal to e to the pi x. Okay? <coughs> and... Uh, the proof requires power series, showing that the power series for each of these is the same. And uh, we have seen a very, very brief glimpse of it previous lecture when we saw that, oh, we can approximate functions by polynomials of the form summation, the nth f, nth derivative of f over n factorial x to the n, right? Um you can extend that all the way and make a power series <clears throat> but that is not something we will co be covering this course okay so for now you should just believe that this holds true okay <clears throat> i also have not defined e to the ix i think i don't remember if i've defined the exponential function very probably we have not okay and uh, so the derivative of it might be something that is hard to prove. Well, in this case, f of 2 pi minus f of 0 is, well, add 2 pi cosine is 1, sine is 0, so this is 1, minus add 0 cosine is 1, sine is 0, so 1 minus 1, which is 0. However, f prime of x <coughs> is equal to i e to the i x okay by chain rule and uh, therefore absolute value of prime of x <coughs> is equal to one for 
all real x. All real x. And so, <coughs> mean value theorem does not hold in this case. Okay? <coughs> if mean value theorem does not hold, then a major consequence of it, which is the <coughs> L'Hopital's rule, will also not hold. Okay? And uh, we can show that with the following example. Uh, on the segment 0, 0,1, consider the function <coughs> define <coughs> f of x is equal to x. And g of x, on the other hand, is equal to x plus x squared uh, e to the i over x squared. e to the i over x squared. Okay? Well, we have seen that um, absolute value of e to the i t is equal to 1 for all reals, for all real t, right? Uh, hence, limit x goes to 0, f of x over g of x is equal to 1. Okay? <coughs> Since if you look at the absolute values, this is going to be 1 times uh, 1 times x squared, which goes to 0, x goes to 0. So, in total, that is going to go to 0. Uh, 0 over 0, you'll get that... Mm, this limit basically acts as x over x. You can divide the bottom by x. You get 1 plus x times e to the uh, 1 over uh, e to the i over x squared, which has absolute value 1 still. So limit is 1. However, next, look at <coughs> g prime of x. Well, g prime of x is 1 plus, by chain rule, 2x minus 2i over x e to the ix squared, i over x squared, okay, not ix squared, <clears throat> for all 0 smaller than 1, smaller than, uh, 0 smaller than x, smaller than 1, which means that g prime of x, the absolute value, is greater than or equal to <clears throat> Did I miss something? 2x. There we go. This is greater than or equal to absolute value of, well, this has absolute value of 1. Right? By triangle inequality, this is greater than or equal to 2x minus 2i over x minus 1. Okay? Triangle inequality of A plus B does not say it's greater than or equal to. It just says less than or equal to. However, uh, triangle inequality of um, G prime X minus 1 would say that, oh, absolute value of G prime X minus G prime, uh, absolute value of um, G prime X minus 1 absolute value is greater than or equal to absolute value of G prime X plus 1. So... This is slightly tricky, but this is true. 2 over x minus 1. And hence, oh. <coughs> hence, absolute value f prime of x over g prime of x is equal to 1 over absolute value of g prime of x is smaller than or equal to Rearranging this, you get x over 2 minus x. Okay? And so, so, um, limit <coughs> x goes to 0, f prime of x over g prime of x is equal to 0 rather than 1, and hence, therefore, LS rule does not hold. Hospitals. 
L'Hopital's rule fails. Rule fails. Okay. <coughs> However, not all hope is lost. Okay. Um, what you can show uh, as a consequence of the mean value theorem, which is not as good as mean value theorem, but it is almost as useful, is that um, so let me just finish these examples here. However, however, what can be shown, um, uh, what can be shown, be shown similar to the mean value theorem, similar to the mean value theorem. value term <clears throat> is that <coughs> this holds for complex values as well as vector values for complex as well as vector value functions as well as vector valued functions is the following absolute value of f of b minus f of a is smaller than or equal to uh, b minus a times supremum a smaller than x smaller than b oops not smaller than or equal to smaller than b absolute value of f prime of x Okay, you can't guarantee equality. Um, you can show this exists. And hence, you have a theorem. Theorem 5.19. <clears throat> Suppose f bar, which is a vector valued function, um, is a continuous mapping. mapping of a comma b into r to the k and f bar is differentiable in a b okay let just to say every single component is differentiable then there exists x in a b then there exists exists x in a b such that absolute value of f of b minus f of a is smaller than or equal to b minus a times f prime of x okay this is basically me saying this property, right? Because if I'm looking on a closed interval, the supremum will be reached. So there will be such an F prime. This is the more systematic way of writing it. Let me prove it. <coughs> Proof. Ah. <coughs> uh. Put z is equal to f of b minus f of a. Put z is equal to f of b minus f of a. Okay, and define and define <coughs> phi of t to be z dot f of t. Okay, so phi of t is a real valued function. So phi of t is a real valued function. Valued function <coughs> on AB. 
which is differentiable. <clears throat> differentiable in a b. Okay. Well, if this is a real uh, <coughs> sorry, if this is a real valued function, then mean value theorem holds for it. Then mean value theorem implies implies five uh, b uh, implies there exists. Let me just say that there exists x in a b such that phi of b minus phi of a is equal to <coughs> b minus a times phi prime of x, which is equal to b minus a times, well, when you are taking derivatives, um, for complex uh, vector value, the chain, uh, the product rule still holds, but now you're doing dot product, right? Z was a constant function, so its derivative is going to be zero. So I only get Z times F bar prime of X. The other term is zero, right? On the other hand, on the other hand, we have that <coughs> Phi of b minus phi of a is equal to z bar times f of b minus f of a uh, minus, well, let me just say this, times f bar of b minus z bar times f bar of a which is equal to well <clears throat> this is just z bar dot z bar so this is absolute value of z squared right because what did i define z as z was f, f of b minus f of a right now the Schwartz inequality now the Schwartz inequality Cauchy Schwartz C H W A R T Z inequality shows <coughs> that absolute value of C or squared which is equal to B minus A times z bar times f bar of x is smaller than or equal to b minus a times absolute value of z bar <coughs> times absolute value of f bar of x okay for dot product um when you are taking product um, in norms, it, the equality is not strict. It's a smaller than or equal to, which is what Schwartz inequality says. <coughs> Hence, we have that absolute value z bar is smaller than or equal to b minus a absolute value of f bar prime of x as required. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> and this finishes my chapter 5. Um, now we move on to chapter 6, which is Riemann Stigelis Integral. I can never pronounce this name correctly. Um, Stale Jess. Stale Jess, maybe. Sorry about this one. I will struggle with the name. And... Uh, yeah, chapter six, the Riemann style jazz integral. Okay, 
So what's the idea? Well, I want to eventually somehow find a way of um, doing the inverse thing. Like, given a derivative, I want to find what is the function whose derivative the given function is. Right? And while this process was not exactly invented for that reason, okay, it is an important consequence that they are equal. Okay? Definition. <clears throat> um, let a be given be a given interval. Let a be be a given interval. Interval. Okay. By a partition P by a partition P of AB, we mean a finite set of points, we a finite set of points <coughs> x0 to xn x0, x1, dot, 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 xn, where the following things hold, where the following properties hold. First, a is equal to x0, smaller than or equal to x1, smaller than or equal to xn, which should be equal to b. Okay? And... <coughs> Um, huh, wait, okay, so <clears throat> the book takes them to be equal, smaller than or equal to, generally, um, a partition is strict, but, well, whatever, so in that case, it's, uh, only this, my bad, so a partition is basically, you're dividing the set into n parts, or n, yeah, n parts x0 to x1, x1 to x2, x2 through x3, we write <coughs> uh, delta xi to be equal to xi minus xi minus 1. Okay? For i is equal to 1 dot 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 n. We do not define delta xi for x zero. Okay. <coughs> now, to a corresponding uh, to a partition, we define some things. Okay. So, suppose f be a real valued function. Suppose uh, f is a bounded real valued function. F is a bounded real function defined on a b okay <clears throat> a very very small note you might think wait a second why do i need to include bounded when i'm already doing a closed interval um only continuous functions are bounded on a uh, closed interval. If you take an arbitrary function, it need not be bounded, right? <clears throat> so I'm taking an arbitrary function and I'm saying, oh, but however, I want it to be bounded. <coughs> okay. Then corresponding to each partition P, corresponding to each partition P, of AB, we put MI is equal to supremum f of x 
for x belonging uh, x smaller than or equal to uh, xi minus 1 smaller than or equal to x smaller than or equal to xi. Okay. Small mi is equal to infimum f of x for the same set. Okay. And I define u of f comma p is equal to <coughs> summation i is equal to 1 to n mi times delta xi. Okay. Similarly, uh, the lower sum, so that is called the upper sum, the lower sum LFP is <clears throat> summation i is equal to 1 to n small mi delta xi. Okay. <coughs> and finally, <clears throat> we define, and finally, We define integral from a to b the upper integral as f of x dx is equal to limit n goes to infinity u f comma p and the lower integral a to b lower integral f of x dx is equal to limit n goes to infinity l of f comma p okay where infimum and supremum where <coughs> supremum and ah i missed something this is not limit infinity this is supremum and infimum what am i doing infimum on the first one supremum on the second one so i'm <clears throat> where infimum and supremum are taken over all partitions p of a b okay so i look at every single partition possible and um i look at the infimum of u f p over that and the supremum of l f p over that so this is called the upper Riemann integral <clears throat> upper Riemann integral this is called the lower Riemann integral Riemann integral though oftentimes with abuse of notation, I am just going to call them the upper and lower integrals. I'm going to skip the name of Riemann, even though he was really good and great and contributed a lot, because it's too many words. Okay? <laughs> if the upper and lower integrals are equal, <clears throat> upper and lower integrals are equal, so if... Um, the upper and lower integrals are equal. Equal. We say that f is Riemann integrable. We say f is Riemann integrable. I R I E M A N N integrable on a b and the book writes it with a very fancy we write f belongings 
belongs to something I I can't draw that R properly. I am going to try. Okay, that's my uh, best attempt at that R. Okay, where this set is going to denote the set of all Riemann integrable functions. <coughs> The set of all Riemann integrable functions. So, okay, that's my best attempt. I'm, I'm done. I'm not. Uh, if you don't think that's an R, not my problem. Treat that as an R. Okay, and we denote the common value, and we denote the common value I can't write common common value <clears throat> by integral from a to b f of x dx okay or is equal to integral from a to b, just f dx. Sometimes f of x dx is kept. Okay, this is called the Riemann integral of uh, f from a to b. Okay, <coughs> uh, now since f is bounded, since f is bounded, since f is bounded. Bounded, there exists m, comma m, such that um, m smaller than or equal to f of x, smaller than or equal to capital M, for every x in a b. Actually, <clears throat> x in a b. Therefore, you can show quite easily m times b minus a is actually smaller than or equal to l f comma p which is smaller than u f comma p which is smaller than or equal to m b minus a m times b minus a and uh, therefore <clears throat> the Riemann integral if it exists satisfies m b minus a smaller than or equal to integral a to b f of x dx smaller than or equal to capital M times v on say if it exists, okay? Um, need not always be equal, but this property is always satisfied. Um, this one, one, as well as two. Okay, both of them are always satisfied. The second, under the condition that it exists, but the first one is always satisfied for every partition p. Okay. Another definition. <coughs> definition. Let alpha be monotonically increasing. Let alpha be monotonically oh, N I C A increasing uh, on A to B. Increasing function, function on A to B, okay, um, if it's monotonically increasing, um, f of A and f of B are defined, and so it is automatically bounded, okay. Uh, for a partition P, for a partition P, part Blah, 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 blah. Partition T of AB. We write, we write delta alpha i is equal to alpha xi minus alpha xi minus 1. So the same way as. Uh, you can define delta f i, okay? <coughs> this is 
Then, for any real function bounded on f, for any real function, function bound f bounded on a b, uh, we put u f p a uh, f p alpha is equal to summation i is equal to one to n m i delta alpha i and l p f alpha is equal to summation i is equal to one to n small m i delta alpha i uh, in case you're forgetting what m i and ca uh, capital m and small m have to do uh let me just write these in the oops standard order pfa um capital m i is again on the interval delta i uh, delta x i it is the maximum okay so that is the role that f is playing even though it doesn't show up here okay um then define define integral a to b upper integral f d alpha as infimum of u f p alpha and the lower integral a to b f d alpha as supremum l p f alpha where this again the infimum and supremum is taken over all partition where infimum and supremum is taken over all partition <clears throat> is taken over all partitions okay <coughs> once again if they are equal if the lower and upper integral are equal integrals are equal Uh, we write write their common value write their common value as a uh, integral a to b f d alpha okay or f x d alpha x or integral a to b f x d alpha x because in case by now you have forgotten uh, alpha is also a function and this is called the Riemann this is called the Riemann style just style just integral integral if you want in short it's often referred to as just uh, the style just integral of f over uh, for f with respect to alpha with respect to alpha over a b okay and we say that um f is integrable uh with respect to alpha in the Riemann sense. Okay? Not the Riemann integral Riemann integral is a special case special case of the 
uh, Riemann style, uh, just integral of the Riemann R I E M Riemann style, just style, just integral, integral when alpha of x is equal to x. Okay. <coughs> Uh, you can also change the notation, okay? So, integral a to b of f of y d alpha y is same as integral a to b of f of x d alpha x as long as um, you have the same bounds. From a to b, it does not matter what letter I use to denote the variable it's always going to be the same it's the same as when you're using um c equals integral a to b f of x d alpha x okay this a and this b actually define what you're doing it so even if you just drop the x it, it does not matter right which is why the previous notation has no x like this notation has no x. It doesn't matter what variable I'm using. Okay. If uh, the bounds are assumed, if the bounds are um, clear, if the bounds a comma b are clear, are clear, uh, we may drop uh, v may write write integral instead uh, instead of integral a to b so for now we are not doing indefinite integrals all of these are definite integrals so for now if i write just an integral symbol it does not mean indefinite integral let's just assume that the bounds are a to b okay Another definition. Okay. Big is this video by now? 42. Okay. I have a few minutes. Um, a partition F, uh, a partition, a partition P star is a refinement, refinement of P if p star contains p as sets okay that is to say every element of p is an element of p star <clears throat> given two partitions partitions p1 comma p2 uh, we say we say p star is their common refinement is their common refinement if p star is equal to p1 union p2 okay so p1 union p2 is always going to contain both p1 and p2 but um, the common refinement is a very special thing. It's not just some arbitrary, uh, uh, what do you call, partition which contains them. It is the unique partition which contains, uh, the smallest partition which contains both of them. Okay? So, after all these definitions, finally we get to the first theorem, theorem 6.4. If P star is a refinement of P, is a refinement of p then um l p comma f comma alpha is smaller than or equal to l of p star comma f comma alpha and and u of 
p comma f comma alpha is greater than or equal to or let me say it this way u of p star l comma f comma alpha is smaller than or equal to u of p comma f comma alpha in other words if the integral exists every refinement is taking you closer and closer to it okay proof <clears throat> so um we'll show that um we'll show it stepwise suppose p star contains exactly one more point um contains exactly one more point more point x star than p than p okay uh, with x i minus one smaller than or equal to actually strictly smaller than i want this to be a proper refinement smaller than p smaller than x uh, sorry x star smaller than x i what am i doing Okay, uh, then these two are consecutive points, right? Put W1 is equal to infimum f of x for um, xi smaller than xi minus 1 smaller than or equal to x smaller than or equal to x star. And W2 is equal to infimum f of x when x is smaller than or equal to x star is smaller than or equal to x. x star is smaller than or equal to x smaller than xi. Okay, so I have split the interval into two parts. Clearly, Clearly, because I am taking the infimum on the two uh, two intervals, like the infimum of xi minus 1 to xi, which was mi, it might be in the first half or in the second half. If it's in the first half and not in the second half, then infimum of the second half is going to be more. If it's in the second half, not in the first half, then the infimum of the first half is going to be more. So W1 is greater than or equal to MI. W2 is greater than or equal to MI. Okay. Um, where MI is equal to infimum of... Well, I'm not going to define it. You should know what MI is. It's the same one every time. Okay. Therefore, um, LF... No. P star comma F comma P alpha so many notations minus L of P comma F comma alpha is equal to well everything else is going to cancel right you're going to left with W1 times alpha of x star <coughs> minus alpha of xi minus 1 plus w2 of alpha of xi minus alpha of x star minus mi of alpha xi minus alpha xi minus 1. Oh, okay, let me do it on the next line. Minus mi alpha of xi minus alpha of xi minus 1.
Okay. Um, let me just say this. If this did not have the extra uh, computation of alpha, uh, the result follows extremely similarly. It's much easier. The complication is because of the extra alpha. Okay. So, complication. Did I say computation? I don't remember what I said. Anyway. Well, this is equal to W1 minus M1 times alpha times X star minus alpha XI minus 1 plus W2 minus M1 alpha of XI minus alpha of X star, right? And this is greater than or equal to zero as uh, both of these are greater and alpha is an increasing function as alpha is an increasing function. This result would not be true if alpha was not an increasing function. Okay. Now, uh, if if P star has K more points than P, more points than P, do it stepwise. Do it stepwise K times. Okay? And hence the result is true, and we have our theorem. Okay? What is the important um, application of this? What is the important consequence? Theorem 6.5, it says integral um, a to b, the lower st uh, style just integral of f the alpha is smaller than or equal to the upper style just integral of f the alpha. This was not obvious if alpha uh, if alpha is not equal to x, right? Uh, you no longer have that. Oh, the lower um the you there is no obvious way of saying that. Oh, um. What do you call um, the infimum is uh, greater? Uh, sorry, the upper sum is greater than the lower sum, and among other things, technically it should be easy to say, but um, that still holds. Actually, that should still hold. Anyway, um, yeah, that should still hold. So. Let P star be the common refinement of two partitions, be the common refinement refinement two partitions P1 and P2 P1 and P2 then <coughs> by 6.4, by theorem 6.4, um, LP1F alpha is smaller than or equal to LP star F alpha, and this is smaller than or equal to UP star F alpha. Which is smaller than or equal to u p two f alpha. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, for any refinement, hence, um, any sorry, not any partitions uh, p one and p two, we have that l of p one f alpha is smaller than or equal to u of p two f alpha. If you fix uh, 
and you take the supremum over one and the infimum over one, uh, you get fixed P2. Take uh, supremum sup over P1, we get, well, if you fix P2 and take supremum, if everything is smaller than this, then the supremum is also smaller than the, uh, equal to this. So um, the lower integral F D alpha is equal to supremum L P1 P F alpha P F alpha, which is smaller than or equal to U P2 F alpha. Now taking infimum taking infimum of p2s um we get the result we get the result okay um Maybe one last theorem. Sure, let's do one last theorem. Theorem 6.6. .6. F is in fancy R. R alpha on AB. Is to say f is Riemann integrable with respect to alpha on AB if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero there exists a partition P such that U F comma P comma alpha minus L F comma P comma alpha is smaller than epsilon. Proof. Okay, so from the previous result, we have for every p, for every p, we have l f comma p comma alpha, f comma p comma alpha, sorry, p comma f comma alpha. You know what, even if I switch that things, please just ignore that, keep one, um, assume that it's the same thing. I don't want to go and correct every single one of them. FD alpha is smaller than or equal to the upper integral FD alpha, which is smaller than or equal to U F comma P comma alpha. Okay. Hence, um, therefore, therefore, if I have, um, um, that u f f comma p comma alpha is smaller than uh, this. So first, let's show this. Okay, uh, showing this way first. I have this. Therefore, zero smaller than or equal to integral f the alpha minus f the alpha lower integral is smaller than epsilon since this is true for every epsilon since this is true for every epsilon every epsilon greater than zero uh, we must have we have that <coughs> F D alpha minus in lower integral F D alpha is equal to zero, which means they're equal. I e um, F bar not F bar F belongs to R of alpha. Riemann integrables with respect to alpha. Conversely, 
conversely, suppose um, f belongs to fancy r of alpha and let epsilon greater than zero, then there exists, then there exists p1 comma p2 such that u of p2 comma f comma alpha minus integral f d alpha is, e, uh, is smaller than epsilon over 2 and integral f d alpha minus l p1 of f d alpha uh, f alpha is smaller than epsilon over 2 right so they might be different integrals but uh, oh, sorry different partitions but you can find such partitions because their infimum and supremum are equal to this right then take the common refinement choose p as common refinement common refinement of p1 and p2 then we have that u of p comma f comma alpha is smaller than or equal to u of p2 comma f comma p comma alpha so p2 comma f comma alpha which is smaller than or equal to integral f d alpha plus epsilon over 2 which is smaller than or equal to l p1 f comma alpha plus epsilon which is finally smaller than or equal to l of p comma f comma alpha plus epsilon okay and that completes the proof okay so you might have seen these results for just the Riemann integral we are showing these results for a slightly stronger set not just the Riemann's integrals but the Riemann style just integrals okay I'm going to stop this lecture here we'll continue on Monday and uh, see how far we can go on Tuesday um, I will try to find a good stopping point by Tuesday probably not the whole lecture Tuesday's lecture will be a shorter one okay